Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War news update, second part thereof for the 25th of October 2023. Uh, even though I was out last night and unable to curate as much kind of news as I'd like to have done, and it's crazy busy for me at the moment, I've got loads to talk about today in this second part with regard to military aid and geopolitical stuff. So let's get on with it. Uh, I'll try and be as quick as possible. Okay. A uh, general comment first. This comes from a, a piece in the C Center for European Policy Analysis, CEPA. Uh, Mick Ryan quotes from it saying, helping Ukraine win this war and then peace is the best investment NATO and its allies can make in their own defense. Okay, let's go and dip into this. It's a good piece. It's not crazy long by Timothy Ash. Sky high costs of abandoning Ukraine. So it talks about uh, what are the costs of not helping Ukraine. If, if the West, if the US, for example, was to stop saying, like, we've run out of, uh, of money, of willpower, of public support. OK, what would happen? Uh, it looks at four elements first. So first, Russian troops would be able to drive through and reach a border to Poland. So where would they stop? This have huge economic, social and political risks on Europe. Uh, that's the, the first obvious one. Second, it would be profoundly reckless for the West to assume that having captured Ukraine, Putin would stop there. So not only would the, there be economic, social and political risks within uh, Europe having Russia at the border, like taking all of Ukraine, but then would it go further? And actually, there's a really interesting point here that is made in terms of migration. But if Russia hit uh, if, if Russia continued its advances and, and took most of Ukraine or all of Ukraine, right, you would see a migration flow, an immigration crisis. So if you're sitting on the right in Europe and you're like, yeah, uh, I have these views on, say, immigration, for example, which is maybe typical of conservatives. They want to conserve what is, don't want change too much. I mean, it's literally the definition of conservatism. And there's no value judgment in this about immigration at all. I'm saying, like, if immigration is your concern, and depending on what you think about Ukraine, you might be someone that's like, immigration is my concern and I don't also want to be supporting, uh, I'm European and I don't want to be supporting aid to uh, Ukraine. If you're one of those people, I don't know how many people that includes, and this is the same for someone on the left could still have those concerns. If Russia were to prevail, there would be a massive immigration crisis in terms of Ukrainians fleeing from Ukraine into Europe. So that's something I hadn't particularly considered. Yes, we talked about refugees before, but that was more like in, in this short term um, sense. But it, but if, if we stopped supporting Ukraine and Russia prevailed, there would be an immigration crisis in Europe. So that, that's an interesting point to be made in this article. A third Russian victory over Ukraine would signal the West's weakness in terms of like NATO, the EU, and that would signal stuff to China, for example, in terms of Taiwan, the Middle East, so on and so forth. So it is geopolitically uh, a known goal to allow Russia to prevail. And fourth, a defeat would prove that Russian blackmail, for example, over energy supplies succeeds. Like the bully tactics work and um and what does that say for nations going forward okay then it ends the article with saying certainly the costs of funding ukraine's defense its budget and then recovery and reconstruction appear large especially when set against the context of a global cost of living crisis true but annual support costs of perhaps a hundred billion dollars are less than one-fifth of one percent of western gdp and less than 10 percent of nato's current defense spending that what is the point of nato if not to stop Russia, stop the Soviet Union as was, doing what it's attempting to do here. I mean, this is literally the raison d'etre of NATO. So less than 10% of its spending on dealing with that is, is, well, surely that makes sense in terms of NATO's raison d'etre. Much of this spending is in any event returned to Western economies, something I've been saying a gazillion times in booming contracts for western especially us and it hyperlinks that to to evidence is defense companies construction companies and others so like i've said before the reason why this money is going out from the eu and from the us is because the eu and the us and other allies gain right you don't give there's no such thing as a free lunch and yes there are moral components here and there will be elements of humanitarian aid particularly in the charity sector but in terms of what governments decide to do they decide to do things. The morality comes much further down the list. 
often they're entwined, but the morality is not what's driving aid to Ukraine quite often. It's ge geopolitical strategy and looking at the power structures around the world and what's in the best interest of, of the EU, NATO and the US. Yeah, we need to do this because otherwise we're, sc we're screwed or this will affect us negatively. And then it's economic uh, reasons as well. So we will give this money to Ukraine because actually, you know, we are getting more out of it. We're getting it, we're investing into Ukraine. We're getting our companies and our defense industries that pay tax dollars in our nations and, and provide employment in our nation and is a money multiplier. We are going to throw a whole bunch of money to Ukraine because that money makes money for us. No such thing as a free lunch. So, yes, there's a moral component that we are going to support you for as long as it takes, but that support will be largely contingent on what the West get back in terms of the geopolitics and the economics. And it's important to, you know, this is the reality, this is real politic, right? Price of allowing Ukraine to fail in this war and recover, yeah, and it's not just what we get back, but it's the opportunity cost of not doing it. So that is, in a sense, a return on investment, or like it's looking at it from an inverse situation, but you, you get the point. Price of allowing Ukraine to fail in its war and recovery and reconstruction will be multiples higher for the West and will then result in a much more challenging defense and security environment. I mean, this is why we pay insurance, isn't it? Et cetera, et cetera. Helping uh, Ukraine win this war and then the peace is the best investment NATO and its allies can make in their own defense. The West might be paying a high price in terms of treasure, but Ukraine paying a much higher price in the blood of its brave soldiers' blood spilled in our defence. So I think that's a, it's not a long article. Uh, interesting uh, little analysis there. The Australian MOD is announcing a new military aid package for Ukraine to the amount of 20 million Australian dollars. That's 12.7 million US dollars. According to the agency's website, the package includes demining equipment, portable X-ray machines and a 3D metal printer and anti-drone uh, or drone systems. Uh, there's some saying it's anti-drone, some saying it's drone. Um, good on the Aussie. Good on you, mate. Really bloody good stuff. Oh, that's strange. Uh, Germany is preparing a new military aid package to protect Ukraine from Russian attacks, said Ukrainian Prime Minister Denis Mihal. If I do a German accent, I'm oh, cool. it's not it's not as funny as doing an Australian accent. Everyone loves an Australian accent. If I do a German accent. Looks like I'm doing some bad ripoff of some 1950s uh, dad's army type UK uh, Second World War program. Uh, the package worth over $1.4 billion. So this is a massive package would come amid threats of Russian attacks on Ukraine's critical infrastructure during the upcoming cold season. However, if we look in a little bit more detail to this, um, Deedua.org says, you probably heard of the $1.4 billion uh, dollar winter package with which Schultz announced today since it's a combination of two packages which were made public in September 400 million euros and October 1 billion euros I give you all the details this is what I quite often say is be careful of announcements announcements that I make uh, uh, as well be careful that they aren't already th things that have already been announced and I do try and tell you if I think that is the case quite often you get something announced here and then an announcement of the delivery of it. And you think uh, these are two different things because certain sources will say a new aid package has, has, arrived, uh, you know, has arrived in Ukraine. It's like, well, that's the aid, aid package I talked about like two months previously has now arrived there. So these are, these are, these are not new, like that's still a piece of news that we already knew about. Just, you know, repackaged here if you like but so sometimes you hear from one source saying something and then a few days later it comes from another source and then uh, or it's announced on the official government channels from what whatever country it is and you, you feel that these are separate announcements they're actually the same announcements you know said in in different ways and at different times so this announcement is the one billion dollar package or euro package sorry that was announced previously which is a patriot bat battery that's eight launchers and 60 around 60 missiles iris t slm so that's a short range no slm is a medium range battery um already announced months prior and the iris t sls that's a short range the s is short m is medium launcher already announced in may three gepard um uh, spags so self-propelled anti-aircraft guns already delivered announced months prior so again Good stuff, brilliant stuff, but uh, 
announced in different different ways previously and then the 400 million euro package is more like uh, ammunition but also a bunch of missiles 200 mraps mine resistant amb ambush protection vehicles mine clearance systems um some armored engineering vehicles and recovery vehicles 50 unmanned surface vessels so those are maritime drones winter clothing power and heat generators spare parts and ordnance disposal equipment so a whole range of stuff really great uh, from Germany as I keep saying Germany have really come up trumps recently but beware because that's not necessarily new stuff that's stuff that's previously been announced German defense company Kraus Maffei Wegmann has joined the defense industries alliance and now there's, there's got to be around 60 companies that are involved from a whole host of countries um been announced by the Minister of Strategic Industry, Alexander Kamishin. He was a guy that used to be in charge of the rail service, got that top knot, quite famous, Does is an, doing an amazing job uh, in what he's doing now, but was put in that position because he did an amazing job with the rail service. Uh, anyway, uh, this company produces Leopard Tanks, Panzer Howitzer 2000 Howitzers and Cheetahs. Uh, cheetahs are the um, Gepard, so Gepard literally means Cheetah, although... Cheetah is also the name of the variant of the Gepard that was uh, sold to the Netherlands. So it's also a slightly different variant of the Gepard, which translates as a Cheetah. So it all gets a bit confusing. Anyway, Latvia. I mean, God, two years ago, did I ever think I'd be sitting online talking about different variants of self-propelled anti-aircraft guns made in Germany for the Netherlands? What's happened to my life? I find it interesting. Go figure. Uh, Latvia has handed over, and so do you guys apparently, uh, Latvia has handed over 61 used ambulances to Ukraine, the Latvian broadcaster LSM uh, reports. The cars were transferred to the Latvian non-governmental organization, I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce that, which will ensure the delivery uh, to Ukraine and deliver them to Ukrainian state institutions, the police and MOD, uh, the army and the Ministry of Health. So great stuff, Latvia. Awesome. Minister of Defense of Ukraine, uh, Rustem Umyarov, so he's a new chap, in, no longer is it um, Reznikov, uh, met in Kiev with the Minister of Defense for Denmark, Charles Lund Poulsen. Quote, the key issue, speeding up the transfer of F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. They also discussed the issue of demining liberated territories, professional training of Ukrainian servicemen, cooperation on the implementation of IT in the Ukrainian army, and a provision of additional assistance. Excellent stuff. Thank you, Denmark. Right, then we're going to move to a Euromaidan press article. NATO urges its member states to increase production of ammunition. But it isn't just this. It's about, because we've heard this for some time anyway. Yeah, they need to ramp it up. All NATO countries need to ramp up their artillery ammunition production, not just for Ukraine, but to keep their own supplies up because they would have been depleted because of Ukraine. Um, it's about standardization as well. So it's a bit like the EU saying recently, ruling that uh, no longer can Apple uh, use Lightning leads. They have to standardize the USB-C because A, is just your way of like guaranteeing yourself more money for these because they're it's different and you have to buy from there but also just standardization so you know you don't need 37 leads to do 37 different things you can use one lead to do everything uh anyway so it's a similar kind of thing that's going on here so nato is pushing the member states to curb protectionism and agree on a standard for artillery ammunition to increase production admiral robert peter bauer chairman of the nato military committee said in an interview with reuters he said that member states need to stop protecting national arms manufacturers and ramp up ammo production to strengthen the alliance's security quote a manufacturer gets rich not because of the printers they produce and this is so true but because of the ink if you produce an artillery shell that only fits the gun you produce then you force users to buy your ammunition and then you can charge more for it right it's just that's a, yeah that's a free market i guess but it, it's it's almost monopolistic in a sense and so this is where regulation comes in to to prevent the free market from you know consolidating into little cartels or little monopolies right so is regulation is trying to actually free the market more here and this is something you does you got to remember i've talked about the contradiction of the eu previously some people think the eu is some kind of left-wing centralized regulatory regulatory like entity it's not it's the opposite it's a neoliberal almost economic right-wing 
uh, approach. It's, it's a free market or a libertarian approach. It's a free market system where you, the idea is within the whole block, you get a free movement of people, capital, products, services. So everything is allowed to move freely so that you can have one big free market. Right? That's, that's what, what it's intended to do. But the contradiction comes where this, the the EU also also has a moral component because I don't want to send this off on a big sidebar. But the free market cannot arbitrate for morality uh, at all. Really, it can only do so on the uh, with the consumers demanding morally good stuff. And so, consumers, as we know from psychology, are irrational and don't make the best decisions and don't have the full amount of knowledge. It means that the free market cannot arbitrate for morality. It doesn't matter what free marketeers tell you, it can't do it. There's something called negative externalities that the free market just can't cope with. So you have to have regulation in order to, to make the free market uh, m have a moral dimension. So that's why you have the, the tr trade block of the EU being this big free market enterprise, a neoliberal enterprise, if you like. But then you have the central EU kind of... Um, power structures saying right and then how do we protect the environment and then how do we protect workers rights and then how do we make it so actually this works fairly and th and that's where the regulation comes in so it's almost like a classic kind of mixed economy um anyway that's a real sidebar there but but this is the case for the um artillery ammunition production which is like if we let the free market go for it then we'll have certain people choosing certain guns that only have certain ammunition and then they can charge what they like for that ammunition people get get caught into this like but like if you've got an apple iphone and you're like sucked into this one ecosystem that means you have to buy all this stuff and they can charge stupid money as apple does for anything right uh, so let, let let's stop that from from happening and then apple makes a gazillion spondulies a second uh, and then the consumers are end up you know supporting that that's that profiteering <sighs> anyway ammunition trentalenko aim 9m generation sidewinders these are surface to surface missiles fired from a plane to a plane uh need to have a seeker lock on before launch and thus have to be on Ukrainian rail launches for the surface to air missiles to work. Right. The newer A9X are built for lock on after launch because they are used from concealed bays on stealth fighters for Nazan's box launches. What's he talking about? Right, there's been this talk about these air to air missiles being used in um in ground launched surface to air missile units so there's talk about the the aim 9x are able to be shot from nazans ukrainians have nazans but there's also talk and i said this the other day i was wondering whether the super cat can can fire these well at a guess trent Zelenko says the aim 9m are being modified for use on this uk super cat chassis aim 132 azran ground launcher so this is already something that's uh, a bit of a frankenstein that can fire um rockets that we wouldn't normally be able to fire a bit like the the books can now fire as i keep saying these anti-aircraft fired from a ship missiles the rim seven sea sparrow missiles goodness why do i know this what's happened in my life um they can now fire from these old soviet era uh, air defense systems because they can't get the soviet ammunition uh, for these uh, and it's the same, it's the same kind of principle here, which is they need to be able to fire missiles. The more types of missiles you can fire, the greater ability you have of getting stock, right? Uh, and sidewinders have been around for a long time. They're very common. And if they can fire these from the ground, that's brilliant. While the new 9X variants can be fired from Nazam's launches, which Ukrainians have. And hopefully they are being adapted to also fire from some of these, which they've just received from the UK. Um, don't know how many. Um, talking about Frankenstein, this is quite common. This isn't something that like, oh, it shows you how desperate they are, which we sometimes see from these, like putting on a naval turret onto, a, onto an old M MTLB armor personnel carrier that we see some of the russians doing this has been done in the middle east in a number of conflicts which is taking like grad launchers multiple launch rocket systems and adapting them to smaller vehicles because they're really mobile they have an advantage it's not desperation it's actually like if we put this on a on an suv if we put like four of these launchers on the back of an suv we can rag around the local area pick up quite easily pick up stuff we only need four rockets keep them on board shoot to a, a place fire these rockets off and then scoot off 
job done and it it becomes actually a useful uh, frankenstein vehicle we're here now we have us supplied humvees with nine tubes from a, a grad bolted on and it might be the grad has been hit maybe the chassis itself has been destroyed can't be used or whatever but the launchers can be used let's get them on the back of one of these and actually it they're pretty useful um ukraine is launching mass production i'm sure there was uh something else no um okay uh ukraine is launching mass production of ratel s kamikaze combat robots according to fedorov the drone passed all the tests it has a 24 kilometer an hour speed range of six kilometers and activity for up to two hours we have seen these or one similar to these not that exact one but one that has a tray that drops off mines they have been used in fact one of them was blown up by the russians i think so they're already using these to lay mines the ukrainians again it's this uh, evolution of drone capability and uh, as you can see capacity uh, the mass production of these now going to russian uh, military aid and situation and and troops and all sorts of stuff we're going to be talking about ukraine intelligence says that russia has ramped up missile production but that it does still fall behind pre-war levels so they this is the impact of sanctions on missile production for the Russians that meant that they couldn't produce them at pre-war levels. But now they have found they're finding ways around this, that they are ramping up the production, but it's still not up to where it needs to be. However, I, as I have said to you in the previous video, I'm really worried about them stockpiling missiles to use in mass waves on ukrainian targets and i'm sure that's happening soon so ukraine braces for massive missile attacks as it says here as R russia builds up its arsenal of caliber and kinjal the daggers the hypersonic missiles um so watch out for that isw russia deploys cheaper domestic drones alongside shahids to evade ukrainian defenses this is a worry for the ukrainians says euromaidan press russia russia is expanding its arsenal of drones to attack ukrainian infrastructure de deploying new domestically produced drones alongside the iranian may shahid 131 and 136 models that have been used in recent weeks according to the isw Russian media reported on the 23rd that Russian forces used lightweight Italmas drones for the first time during a recent attack on Kiev Oblast. According to mill bloggers, the Italmas models are cheaper and harder to detect than Shahids, but carry smaller payloads. That's your trade-off. Bigger the drone, uh, the slower it will go, the, maybe the, the shorter the range, but uh, the more easily it is to detect, the easier it is to detect. So bigger payload, gives you gives you that, that trade-off um, anyway the isw also reported that russia is likely using the atamas drones together with shahids to maximize impacts quote the shahids deliver heavy blows with their larger warheads while the cheaper atamas drones can evade defenses and strike targets that shahids can't reach uh, earlier this month isw assessed that russia was expanding its stockpile of various missiles guided bombs and drones for strikes on ukrainian targets the introduction of italmas drones is likely part of this wider effort to acquire new munitions this is a case of um, expanding their portfolio if you like diversifying their portfolio of um, aerial threats to to ukraine anton gerishchenko who just to remind you um, is the Ukrainian advisor to the Minister of Internal Affairs. Uh, Kadarov, Ranzan Kadarov, the Chechen war lord who is still alive, it seems, but possibly hasn't been particularly well. He's not as mobile. He's certainly larger than he used to be. Uh, don't know whether that's steroids, being on steroids for, for illnesses and whatnot. Kadarov announced the formation of the Sheikh Mansur Battalion, which is to be incorporated into the Russian MOD. Now, as he goes on to say, you might recognize that name. So interestingly enough, a military unit of the same name was earlier established in Ukraine. Chechens of this unit, of the, of the Ukrainian one, fight for Ukraine and for the free Chechen Republic of Ichkiria. It consists of primarily Chechens who fled Chechnya during the Second Chechen War. And this is where Ramzan Kadyrov, as a warlord, switched sides and was able to you know, power monk, power hungry warmonger there would be no great reason why uh, uh particularly a muslim chechen warlord would want russia to have ultimate power over chechnya but he switched sides and that's what's happened and he's he himself has huge amounts of power who knew sheikh mansur is an anti-russian historical figure you know ideology goes by the wayside when uh in in when faced with the the option of gaining power. Uh, Sheikh Mansur is an anti-Russian historical figure, so the creation of the battalion with his name uh, in Russia could be both trolling 
and another attempt by Kadyrov to test the limits of what is allowed. So that's an interesting dynamic there. Possibly Kadyrov once again wishes to assert his autonomous and independent status and demonstrates the extent of his influence in Russia. So you can understand Sheikh Mansour being named for a an anti-Russian pro-Ukrainian Chechen unit, but it makes less sense under Kadyrov unless it's a way of uh, it's probably more likely him saying to the unit in Ukraine, well, we can do that too, um, type thing. So it's an answer to the Ukrainians rather than trolling the Russians, well, although it could be both, who knows. Uh, right. Dmitry from War Translator says, Russian servicemen with call sign 13th, someone we dipped into a lot, is complaining about the creation of Kadyrov of a Chechen battalion named Sheikh Mansur. He calls Chechnya a region of tax subsidies and criticizes uh, Kadyrov's son Adam, who's, I think, recently received Hero of Chechnya Award for beating up a, a POW. Uh, 13th, or, or prisoner, 13th, along with other Russian servicemen, love attacking Kadyrov's Chechnya, highlighting previous Chechen attempts to secede from Russia, but for some reason they always fail to mention who it was who gave Kadyrov all the power. They never talk about Putin because he's the one they're fighting against Ukraine for, uh, but they seem fine with this dissonance. If they are happy with tolerating Putin, why complain about Kadyrov at all? Anyway, interesting dynamics that exist inside the Russian information space and inside the Russian military um, hierarchies and, and set up. Right, a new battalion made up, so we're now going to Ukraine to talk about new battalions. A new battalion made up of entirely of, of Russians has been formed by Ukraine to fight against Russia. This will be an official army group. And so this is not like the Russian Volunteer Corps and the Free Legion of Russia or whatever the other two are that are semi-autonomous units, although they do seem to get equipment from uh, Ukraine, which has caused some consternation because they've done attacks into Russia using like Humvees and Polish weapons and American this, and then the other countries have been like, yeah, no, don't do that. And that's possibly why they've gone a little more quiet on that front. Um, nonetheless, here we have a, a new battalion of Russians being formed by Ukraine to fight against Russia that will be under the uh, the control of the central Ukrainian army, an army grouping not related to the Free Russia Legion. So that's from Bloomberg. Be interested to see how that works um, going forward. And finally, in the military aid, this is a T-55 tank on the front line. This is the idea. So when there was talk about T-55s and T-54s going to the front line, I talked in one of my videos about how they're probably going to be used as artillery. So you can put them in revetments, you can angle them up and use them for indirect fire. So direct line of direct fire is what you can see. You shoot at like a rifle or a, or a tank. But if you're going to fire up and hit something you can't really see, then that's indirect fire, like mortar, like like tanks being used like this. Someone then wrote a big comment to mine saying, "You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, that's not you need, you need some military knowledge. That's not how they'd be used." And then I did a video saying, "Actually, it does just here. It does happen to be the case. I do know what I'm talking about. Here's how the Americans used tanks for indirect fire in." Uh, in the Korean War, and here are some images of that. And then here are how the, what was it, the Azerbaijanis, or was it the Armenians? I think it was the Azerbaijanis used uh, tanks, T-55 tanks, for indirect fire in 2021, right? Against Armenia, or vice versa. Uh, and so it, it has been done, and then loads of analysts then started saying, it looks like they're going to use them from artillery, and I think they have been used for, like, in, indirect fire. Well, here's one being used not for that it appears being used in uh, in the front line which says that they need tanks if they're going to start using these low quality tanks on the front line then that shows that the figures we talk about in my first video of the day those huge tank losses that, that are taking place on a daily basis are really happening to to at least some large extent that it, that they're having to use the the very worst tanks on the front line rather than just as artillery right Okay, going or indirect fire at least. Um, depends how you define artillery. Right, going on to geopolitical stuff. Whew. Right, the key of independence. Uh, so when you do like off the back of a 34 minute video of like stream of consciousness and then do another 34 minute video stream of consciousness, it gives your brain some good exercise. Uh, I was speaking to my MS because I've got progressive multiple sclerosis, speaking to my MS nurse last month saying, right, this is what I do. I'm really crazy busy, but what I'm busy doing is not enough exercise, so I need to sort that out. My legs aren't very good. My walking's rubbish. 
but my brain is getting a really good workout. She says, that is absolutely perfect. You are doing this and this and this, right? You're taking the right supplements, you're doing all this, yeah, and your brain workout is really super important. So, hey guys, this is part of my therapy. Um, Kiev Independent, EU makes progress in shift away from Russian energy. This is super important. Okay, the European Union is largely on track to break its dependence on Russian fossil fuels by 2030, according to European Commission report published uh, yesterday. The EU has reduced coal imports from Russia by 90%, but more importantly, Russian gas imports have dropped by almost 75% from 2021 to 2023. Caveats. There are imports of l liquefied gas, l um, LNG, that will be liquefied natural gas that will be coming from other places that will probably have Russian uh, origins. This is also the same with oil. So oil, crude oil gets delivered from... So Russians' crude oil exports have actually, I think, gone up in certain ways to other nations like India. But what they're doing is they're exporting crude oil, which is your lowest value oil. So places like India are taking... They're saying, yeah, we'll have your oil, but we're not going to have crude oil because we can add the value to that ourselves and that will produce jobs for us and greater uh, profit for us. But what India, for example, are doing are is taking crude oil, putting it through their own refineries and then adding the value to that and exporting it. So Russia aren't really getting all the profit from that. They're actually they're only exporting the low value crude oil. So they might have had an uptick in in crude oil exports but not in oil export or refined oil exports which is where the money is so in a sense you know uh, it's india making the money off that and if they sell that to say an eu country then the eu country is buying crude oil from russia effectively that's been refined through india but the money is mainly going to india rather than to russia so but you can still argue that russia is still getting something so but are they getting enough and are they making a loss eventually compared to where, well, not a loss, but the budget shortfall compared to where they thought they were at? All of these dynamics are really important to understand in, in where we sit on what's going on and how it all works. Anyway, after Russia weaponized Europe's dependency on energy imports during the winter of 2022-3, the EU put significant effort into preparing for the upcoming winter. About almost 99% of gas storage facilities are full. This is huge important. Providing breathing room against possible supply shocks, price hikes, or renewed attempts by Russia to weaponize their supply. The EU has also made progress towards, and this is super important as well, and I love this because, as you know, I'm a big fan of renewables. And people, whenever I say renewables are cool and they should be used more, people always have a go at me. It's the future, but it might not be the center. You might need a lot of nuclear or something. But it's so important. If you can get localized production, you are sorting out energy security, you're sorting out sustainability. Uh, uh, yes, there are certain elements that are going to be needed to make some of these things like the batteries and whatnot. But it's, it's better than your fossil fuels, I think. And, and, and we're finding new supplies of these. But, but it's, it's giving off less pollution and whatnot than your, than your fossil fuels. And energy security is better. Um, and here we see that the UAE has made progress in its goal of transition to renewable by 2030. In 2022, 39% of electricity came from renewable sources. Was it, did I not report sometime during this year that during the height of summer, was it Portugal was making, was it 100% or 95% of its energy from renewables? This is huge, right? So, this is, you can forget the environmental thing. Don't be stuck in the mud going, oh, no, I, I, because I sit politically here, I'm anti-renewables for some weird reason. But technology is moving on. I, I was having a chat to me old mucker, um, me old mate Thierry, it, who's talking about like, well, actually, you know, photovoltaic cells are not very efficient. And I was like, no, you need to look at the latest research. Like they're up to uh, using a, a, a new new technology. Okay, it's not online yet, but they've got up to like 34% efficiency, I think it is, which is massive compared to where it's come from. So these things are moving on. And, and yeah, if we're, we're thinking of, of, of renewables in terms of our thought processes from 1990 or 2000, what, 25 years since then, is a lot has changed right and so there is there is loads of scope for renewables to play a really important part but from geopolitical positioning or of a point of view this is super important because it gives you energy dependency independency sorry the quote worst effects of the energy crisis may now be behind us the report said but there is no room for complacency 
Of course, there's still. Re- I mean, as as p- people point out, there are still issues with with some of the, as I said earlier, some of the raw materials needed for some of these things and batteries and so on. But but the new finds in the US, in Norway, in terms of some of these um, some of these elements being found in massive quantities means that actually uh, is is not as dodgy as it was even like one year ago. But these things change a lot. Uh, anyway, I think that's really good for the EU to, to be in that position. The US Senate may block a request ugh, for $106 billion to Ukraine and Israel, says Politico. Uh, this is due to great divisions in the Republican Party, and it will be very difficult to gather the necessary number of votes. Even worse than that, it appears, according to the Wall Street Journal at least, think about their positioning maybe, a number of Republican lawmakers oppose combining US aid to Israel and Ukraine in the Biden administration's request for the 160 106 billion dollar additional funding there is widespread support among republicans um, republican senators for aid to israel however less support for ukraine it's a real shame because the senate where you've got 100 senators it's not the house where there's a, a blockage at the moment because the republicans don't have a majority speaker for the, to represent their uh, rep- representatives in the Senate, there's 100 senators, two from each state, and it's a slight majority, like paper-thin majority for the Democrats. But there's been strong bipartisan support for Ukraine so far. Well, if that's changing, which is the implication here, and I don't know if that's definitely the case, if it's the, the Senate where there could be um, a, a, a vote not in support of Ukraine, then that is a real worry. But that's not necessarily the case. We'll have to wait and see. Right. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban sheesh, compared Hungary's membership in the EU to Soviet occupation of Hungary during the speech commemorating the anniversary of U- Hungary's 1956 anti-Soviet revolution. Quote, today, things pop up that remind us of the Soviet times. Yes, it happens that history repeats itself, Orban said at the event from which all media were excluded, except Hungary's state broadcaster. How convenient. Oh, oh, dictatorship. Uh, quote, fortunately, what was once tragedy is now a comedy at best. Fortunately, Brussels is not Moscow. Moscow was a tragedy. Tragedy. Brussels is just as bad contemporary parody. In other words, Moscow is now cool. Brussels is now the old Soviet Moscow. Notably, Orban had a meeting with Putin in China last week. Right. Next to reports here. Joseph Perel, the, uh, who's quite high up in the EU, representative for foreign affairs and security policy. No one obliges Hungary to be in the European Union. I think the EU is getting, or certain elements of the EU are getting fed up with, with Hungary and, well, with Viktor Orban. Uh, it'll be interesting if they do create a way to kind of uh, extricate Hungary from the EU and whether that would cause a massive upset within the population of Hungary as they realize that Orban is really taking them down uh, a pro-Russia, pro-authoritarian dictatorship route. Um, I don't know. Former Conservative chair, you see these issues happen all over the shop uh, and UK Security Minister Sir Brandon Lewis has just taken a job advising Letter One, the primary investment vehicle set up and still partly owned by two sanctioned Russian oligarchs, Pyotr Avan and Mikhail Friedman. Okay, interesting. Uh, you know, UK politics is not averse to having uh, a lot of, well, there's been a lot of criticism over the last decade of Russian influence within London. It's called London Grad. Uh, the amount of Russian oligarchs' money. And the amount of money that is laundered through London is phenomenal. I think it was the top place in the world for a number of years. Uh, and then Boris Johnson, because of the connection between the Conservative Party and certain Russian oligarchs, people were expecting the Conservative Party to be quite compromised with regard to Ukraine. But Boris Johnson came out of blocks absolutely for Ukraine, which then caused a bit of dissonance and it caused a bit of... Um, eyebrow raising but like in a good way oh nice nice one boris you know uh, position himself really pro ukraine but there will be elements of the political uh machine in in london in westminster that will have connections to russian money of course there will be um and in this case you know brandon lewis might be uh, might be raising some eyebrows there or it might just be you know Hey, I'm taking money in, in from an investment vehicle. It just so happens it's it's partly owned by Russian oligarchs. So what type thing? Shashank Joshi says, I am confess I'm baffled by the story. A week ago, officials and insiders thought Russia was most likely responsible for the recent Baltic pipeline, the Baltic connector, not the Balti connector. That's the bus that takes you to the uh, 
to the curry house down the road. That's a Baltic connector. The Baltic connector is different. It's a pipeline and cable from Estonia to Finland, um, and it was disrupted. In fact, there appeared to be two different incidents, uh, one with the gas connector, one with the, the cables. Now, growing evidence that Chinese ownership was behind it. How do we interpret this? So this is the, um, the new, new polar bear. Right, on top of that, Finnish police have identified an anchor from a Hong Kong shipping, fun fact, he used to live in Hong Kong, uh, from Hong Kong shipping boat as likely cause of Baltic pipeline damage. I was only a kid. Uh, the damage caused to the Baltic connector gas pipeline between Finland and Estonia was likely the result of an errant anchor dropped from a Hong Kong registered shipping vessel, the Finnish National Bureau of Investigation announced yesterday. However, someone says here, multiple drops, obviously, as there are cables damaged also in many places. And it's not, this is not by accident or, you know, something needs to explain the fact that in the same general time period, we've got cable damage and gas uh, connected damage. So, interesting we'll see yeah dropped anchor and engine still running uh, russian owned shipping company a chinese ship previous departure from russian port destination so it does get difficult here because apparently that chinese ship may have um connections it to uh yeah as expected, the ownership chain is murky, as I understand. Although the ship is registered under Xinjiang Shipping in China, that is owned and operated as part of Torgmol, Russia. Um, so, yeah, just because China's involved doesn't mean that Russia isn't involved. Uh, this is one of those things that will rumble on, I, I'm sure, as new things will be found. Uh, yeah, fascinating. Right, the EU is to set a... to Sorry is set to present a report on progress made by Ukraine in its membership bid. So accession of Ukraine to the EU, they are jumping through hoops to try and get uh, the all the boxes checked. Uh, the annual assessment by the EU based on Copenhagen criteria is a key stepping stone in the bloc's decision to whether to start accession talks with Kiev. Hopefully they are doing well. The, uh, von der Leyen has previously, previously said that she's been impressed by how much progress Ukraine are making, particularly in a time of war. NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg reportedly told allies in a letter that Sweden should join NATO at the latest during a foreign minister's uh, meeting on November 28th to 29th. Sweden said it would consider j sending JS Jazz 39 Gripen to Ukraine after NATO membership. This is so important. Sweden needs to be part of NATO so that they can properly get involved with the hopefully deployment of or or the donation or the selling of Jazz 39 Grippens to Ukraine, amongst other things. So uh, that's really important. We know that Erdogan has has signed that and it's waiting now for Turkish Parliament to ratify it. Moldova blocks access to Russian media used as part of the information war. This is brilliant. Moldova blocked access to 22 Russian media sites, so long overdue, saying that they were used as part of an information, information war against the country, according to a decree published by Moldova's Security and Information Service. Excellent stuff. Now, finally, I'm going to talk to you about, uh, is it Sarah Wagenknecht, the left-wing politician who's starting a party that's going to be more in line with Russian appeasement? I made uh, qu probably quite um, speculative and, and completely unevidenced claims that she may be in the pocket of the, of the Kremlin. So I was called out on that quite rightly. So now lots of people have weighed in on her, lots of Germans uh, from all areas of political spectrum in Germany. And I've got as many opinions on her as I have comments here. Um, someone says, I don't like her any more than you do. But as you say, justice where justice is due, credit where credit is due. I live in Germany. I've been listening to her on German chat shows for years. She's definitely not our, on our wavelength. But to describe her as pro-Putin sympathizer who is who is on the payroll, it's verging on being libelous. Yep, correct. Uh, she isn't. She has condemned Putin and its attack on Ukraine. She's a bog standard pacifist when it comes to Ukraine. She believes that they should negotiate with Putin, and that is what half of Europe believes. I believe the Ukrainians know best when and if to negotiate, but I don't slag her off because she has a different opinion. Correct. I hardly agree with anything she says, particularly not the idea that Germany should start reimporting Russian gas. Why do you call her a populist? Well, that's because that that's how she's been reported. Well, perhaps she is one because she is up there amongst the most three popular politicians in Germany. Uh, so it, it, you can only dream of her popularity. That's not quite what populism means. It's about like raising uh, political movements from from the the. It's not like autocracy where it's top down. It's like bringing the bottom up, 
but doing so with quite often um, problematic politics, whether it be kind of mass anti-immigration sentiment to, to build people's resentment of others, and then you can build a kind of nationalist fervor from the bottom up. That's the point of populism. That's how I would understand it. The word populist is just used to refer to a politician that one disagrees with, so I disagree with that. Um, but whether it applies to her or not is up, up for debate because I don't know her well enough. So you should know better as a philosopher than to use uh, that meaningless word. I don't think it is, was meaningless and it, it is as described, but it depends whether she can be described as that accurately. And you should stop demonising or quoting demonisers. Uh, she is a Jeremy Corbyn with German chat shows, a Democrat and MP. Possibly... Okay, a German leftist, I just have to say that the person, Sarah or Sarah Wagenknecht and everything she stands for, um, yeah, I would say her interest is mainly in herself and who she feels connected to makes me extremely disgusted and angry. Thanks, Jonathan. Regarding her in Germany, she is or was a member of the left party, but they lost a lot of support due to the fact that they did not manage to get rid of her. She is indeed a Putin puppet. For, and now, so this is someone saying she is a Putin puppet, disagreeing puppet, disagreeing with the other person. After systematic destruction of the parliament, left goes to, so it's called the left party, um, to sow further unrest and undermining support for Ukraine. She is so blinded by the red flag uh, with a hammer and sickle of the Russian army that she's willing to ignore uh, the Russians uh, refer to the Soviet Union only in terms of territorial extension and geopolitical influence. It's a shame she is extremely intelligent and a good speaker. My only hope is she takes more people away from AFD, so that's a right wing party, than Die Linke, which is the left, which is the left wing party. But we will see. So that's the idea that if she has populist um, rhetoric, she might actually attract from the far right as much as from the far left. Uh, uh, Vargin Connect is one of those highly intellectual, strangely. Uh, speaking left-wing persons without much respect for democracy. For me, she thus fits in with the Gnosticism pattern as she obviously considers herself standing above the common people. She's riding the left rail for Putin and I think her main motivation is anti-US but what happened here was long expected and is no surprise uh, and might be healthy for the German left party. Um, and, you know, so, so many of these differing opinions on who she is and what she's doing and why she's doing it and geostrategical level here and blah, blah, blah. So um, so someone's saying she's not the left, she's become a nationalist. Uh, she's just nuts and on the Kremlin payrolls. Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, she's calling her a grifter. So lots of different opinions on her. And who am I as a British person to know the, the truth here? Because all of those all of those comments from German people give me completely different ideas of who she is and what my, my opinions were taken from just the media I was reading because, honestly, I don't know that much about her. So anyway, it could well be a corrective on my part. I was being speculative, but I was kind of drawing in, 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 um, inferences from my own inferences from what was implied in in the media I was reading which will itself be skewed so forgive me if I was if, if I was off kilter there but I I don't know this person you guys know her better than me but even there you agree anyway thanks for watching please like subscribe and share it's been a really long one I knew it would take care speak soon